Hi everyone, I'm Mike Richter and today we're going to be talking about different places that you can find properties for sale other than your local realtor sites like Realtor.com or Trulia or Zillow. And we're looking for properties that are in distress so that we are more likely to be able to purchase it with more equity already in our pockets. So we're going to be looking at two ways to go about finding property. And thankfully, they're both at the same website for me. And this is the Tom Green County, Texas uh, County Clerk's page. And every month there is a foreclosure sale. And twice a year, there's a tax sale. So the foreclosure sale is for properties where the owners are not paying their mortgage and the banks are foreclosing on them. That's one thing. And then the tax sale is where uh, people have delinquent taxes on their property and over a period of time, the county attempts to collect on the taxes and if they're unable to, then they repossess the property. So that's something to keep in mind. If you have a property that's entirely paid off, it is entirely possible that you can lose possession of that property by not paying property taxes. So that's one of those things that just never goes away. And I'd personally like to see property taxes go away, but apparently people like having uh, city police and firefighters funded through property taxes. And so that's just the world we live in right now. So on this page, we see two things. We see the tax properties for sale and the trustee sales. So first, let's take a look at the tax properties. So if I were to click that, it would bring up this sheriff sale. And basically what we've got is one of the law firms in town handles the auction and sale of the tax properties in our county. Now, before we go any further, I want to make a distinction that different localities treat property taxes in different ways. Some states are generally tax lien states where a person can go and auction on the rights to collect property taxes on a property. And if you get those rights to collect and after a certain period of time you are unable to collect or the property owner does not pay you your certain amount of rate of return that the state promises you, then you get to take possession of the property. However, in the state of Texas, where I'm at, we are a tax deed state. So basically what happens is I go to an auction and I agree to pay a certain price for the property. And depending on whether the property is homestead, like it's owner occupied and that's where the, the person claims is their homestead or it's not homesteaded, there are different rules associated with how long I have to retain possession and give them the opportunity to redeem their right to possess. And for example, here in Texas, if you get a property that's not homesteaded through a tax sale, after two years, you get to go ahead and sell or refinance or do whatever you would normally do with a property. And the property owner would not have the right to redeem the value of the property. However, if you were to say buy a house for $20,000, let's say, in our area, the right of redemption costs 25% throughout that whole first year that I would have possession. So if I paid $20,000, then the previous owner would have to pay $25,000 in order to redeem their right to have the property. So then I would get that $25,000, the $20,000 that I paid in and the $5,000 worth of interest. However, on the second year, they would have to pay 50%. That means if I paid $20,000 and after 366 days of me legally possessing the property, if all of a sudden they wanted to get together $30,000, they could pay $30,000 and I would have to give them the property back. I would get my initial 20,000 plus 50% on top of that. So that's something that you have to be aware of. 
One of the cool things about it, though, is if I were to take possession of a house, right, I would be able to rent it out to somebody for that year or two years, collect the rent, and then if they were to redeem the property, we would have to figure out how that would be handled. Now, I want to make sure that it's very clear to everybody that you consult uh, competent legal counsel and accounting counsel uh, when going into more advanced uh, real estate acquisition strategies like tax properties and foreclosures. So let's go ahead and take a look at this list right now. So the auction is going to take place on the 2nd of May. That's great. So I've got a little bit over two weeks to research these properties. And we scroll down and we've got a list of properties. They let us know what the lawsuit number is, who currently owns the property, a description of the property, what the minimum bid is in order to, to bid on the property in the first place, what their post-judgment taxes are, what they're due, and an address if it's available to them. So I've already gone through this list earlier today, so let's take a look at a couple of things. Uh, first off, we noticed this first property. It's owned by a gentleman by the name of Lee Fowler, and we know that it's a mobile home. Looking at the minimum bid, we see that the minimum bid is $25,000. So that's kind of an interesting thing. It's a 1993 double wide. It's 28 feet by 48 feet. So maybe 25,000 is a reasonable amount to pay for this. Let's go ahead and take a look at other available information on this. So what I would do is I would go to the Tom Green County Appraisal District and I would search by the name of Fowler Lee. Oh, here we go. Lee and Lori Fowler on this address right here. Let's go ahead and click on it. So we see that they, they don't even live here. They live in Carlsbad, or at least that's where they get their mail from. Taking a look at this information, we see that it's a mobile home that was built in 1959, apparently. Why would they say 59 if the sheriff's page says 93? I would go ahead and go with the sheriff's page on this one. So it's 1,382 square feet, so it's about 1,400 square feet. And their property taxes, they're only being charged $12,000 in property taxes. So how in the world, or well, it's, their valuation is 12000 For 2016, they're only charged about $239. So what is going on here? Let's go ahead and take a look. So up here in the corner, we've got this tax summary button. And we can take a look. And it shows us that they have been paid property taxes on this since 1998. So we've got a lot of back property taxes that have added up to create this $25,000 mess that they've got. Now, personally, I'm not in the business of buying mobile homes that are over 20 years old. So the thought of paying $25,000 for that mobile home is cringeworthy to me. So I'm going to just move on from there. So let's take a look at something that could be really good. Let's scroll down here. Two, there we go. We've got the Bannister family apparently has got some issues right here. We see that there are three different tax suits for Quinton R. Bannister Jr. We notice there's three separate properties. One of them, this might be kind of hard to read for you. It's hard to read for me. It's at $22,603 is the minimum bid for this property. So if we take a look at this description, it looks like it's two lots and it is in the Ratliff subdivision. So maybe we should go ahead and take a look at this. The address is 3312 Lake Drive. Might be an interesting thing. Let's take a look at what else we've got going here. Track two, lots three, four. Okay, so another piece of property in the Ratliff subdivision. And then finally, we've got track three, lots three and four in industrial place edition. 
Hmm, that looks like it's going to be an industrial subdivision. So let's take a look on the appraisal district and see what we can find out. Let's start by typing in his name. Bannister. So this is interesting. We noticed that none of the properties in Tom Green County are owned by somebody by the name of Quentin Bannister Jr. So that, that tells us that there's something interesting going on here. Now let's go back to this page and we'll see if any of them match the address. 405 West 34th Street. 405 West 34th Street. It's owned by a person named Deidre Bannister. So maybe they're related. Okay, so we've got Deidre Bannister. We see that it is a 1,500 square foot house that was built in 1960. It looks like she got possession of this property in 2013, so August of 2013. And Quentin Bannister passed away at that time. So let's see. Well, we noticed that there's a marker here, 2007 and 2012. That's usually an indicator in my area that there's some back taxes owed. And if we see that that address is on the sheriff's sale, then there's very likely to be some back taxes owed. So what do we see? We see that since 2009, there haven't been any taxes paid on it. That's pretty interesting because back in 2008, hmm, there still wasn't any taxes paid. So it looks like it took a while for Mr. Bannister's estate to be settled so that Deidre can get possession of this property. Now, this is a little extra tidbit on estate planning. If generational wealth is important to you, you might want to let your heirs know that it's important for paid off property to have its taxes paid. Because at this point, in order to retain ownership or possession of the property, Deidre has got to figure out how to come up with $16,157 by the 2nd of May. So this is definitely something I'm interested in taking a look at, and maybe I'll go and knock on her door and see if she's aware that there's an issue. And if not, then I can make her aware, and hopefully she can be able to stay in her home if she's got the ability to, to come up with the money or find a way to make it happen. If not, then I can find a way to help her solve the problem if she's open to that. So let's take a look at some other things. Because we see there's an issue here, I wonder what's going on with the other properties. So let's type in, since we know that Quinton is not the, the titled owner of this property, let's type in the address, 3312 Lake Drive. So we'll return to our search, search by property address, 3312 Lake Drive. Uh, there's a lot of different nomenclatures for it, so I'm just going to type lake for a nice generic search and find 3312. Okay. Apparently now it's owned by a WM Randall Investments LLC. So let's take a look at the status. So what do we see here? We see that there's an indicator for back taxes owed. That's interesting. We see that the house was built in 1959. Let's see square footage 22 64. Hmm. And oh, it apparently has a second floor of 1170 square feet. So it's a fairly large house. So if I'm doing my math right, that's 3,454 square feet. And we also notice that it's got a swimming pool. Taking a look at the deed history on this property. It looks like the original Mr. Bannister purchased it in 1991 and title went from himself to his estate in 2012 and it looks like this WM Randall Investments 
purchased it in 2015. So let's take a look at what's going on here. I've got a deed instrument right here. Maybe we'll look into that later for further research. But that's kind of interesting. We're looking at a nearly 3,500 square foot house with a pool. And let's look at the sheriff's sale. What's the minimum bid on this? $22,603. So this is definitely something I'm going to drive by and take a look at because I know that it's owned by an investment company and that the minimum bid is only $22,000. Now let's go back and take a look at the tax summary on it. We see that the taxes owed are $41,000, but the actual taxes due are $23,469. And we see that the additional fees are what add up to the $41,000. So let's go ahead and mark that. I'm definitely going to take a look at that. Now, what's an example of an OK property? Let's go ahead and scroll down to this one right here, Carl Ivy. Went ahead and look this up beforehand. Let's go to search by name. Ivy, looks like Carl and Mary Ann. So it seems like there was a death in the family. And a Sonia Anderson ended up inheriting the property. And once again, we have the indicator that there's some taxes owed on the property. Let's see. Apparently, they still have a homestead exemption, even though presumably uh, Carl is not living there anymore. And we know that Sonia doesn't live there either because she lives in Sanger, Texas instead of San Angelo here. So what have we got here? We've got a house that's about 1,250 square feet. It's got an assessment value of $104,000. We see that it was originally purchased by Carl Ivey back in 1995. So it's very likely that it's paid off. It's a house that was built in 1980, so it's a fairly new house. And it's 7481 Duckworth Road. And it looks like it comes with some land. There's a whole acre associated with it. Let's take a look at the tax summary. Okay, so we see that there's some taxes owed, but it does not quite make sense why they're showing up on the sheriff's sale. But we do know that the minimum bid here is $1,689. So I am definitely going to go and take a look at this property. And I'm going to be bidding on this thing. But I have to determine after I drive by, just taking a look at the outside, how much is it worth to me? And how much do I need to be ready to be able to pay at the day of the auction? Let's see if there's anything else to share here. On the third page, we also see a trend. We've got two properties owned by Kevin Parks, both on Sierra Trail. Let's look at their descriptions. They're in Orient Ranch Estates. So they're, uh, they're in a more rural area. So I'd imagine that there'd be some land here. How much are the minimum bids? 7700 and 5300 so let's take a look turn to search name parks kevin kevin parks there we go and sure enough we've got the sierra trail deal that shows up if we look at the legal description it tells us that we're looking at 5.6 acres on one of the plots and 23.1 acres on the other plot. Now my family and I are looking to purchase acreage so that we can have an out of town country house. So this might be something that I'd be interested in purchasing for me. So let's take a look at the property and see what's there. So it looks like on 7110 Sierra Trail, we've got two mobile homes and a storage shed on the property. 
one mobile home is 1064 square feet and the other one's 960 square feet. It's kind of interesting. So if my family ever decided to move out of our home and move into the country full time, we'd at least have something to start with uh, while we purchase another property or we build a property or build a house on the land over there. So let's see, Kevin Parks purchased it in 2006. Let's see what our tax summary is. So right now he only owes about 3,300 in taxes. That's kind of interesting. Now let's take a look at his other property. So once again, it's the same Kevin Parks, still 23 acres. He purchased it in 2006. The taxes he owes on this property for 2016 was only $26.17. So there's got to be something interesting going on here. And if we look at the tax valuation, we notice that the land value and the production market value are very different. You see the production market value is 71,770 and their agricultural loss is 70,400. So he's got an ag exemption on this property which makes his taxes so low. But it looks like on this property there are no taxes owed. So that's kind of an interesting deal. So it's kind of interesting that there are no taxes owed on this property. So that means that I'm going to have to do more research as far as what the story could be on this. And I may end up just calling Dean and Dean and see if they're willing and able to share what the rest of the story is. But that's definitely a property that I'm interested in. Because even if I get just the acreage, just the acreage alone is a pretty interesting deal. Now, let's take a look. We've gone through the entirety of the sheriff's sale. So we talked about tax sales and that. Something important to remember about tax sales is that you need to be able to pay the entirety of your bid amount in cash or in certified or cashier's funds. So you need to have quick money available in order to play in the tax auction game. So one thing that I've got going for me is that I've got substantial equity in the house that I live in. So I can open up a home equity line of credit and be able to tap into that line of credit very quickly to purchase some of these outright if that's uh, what it comes to. In addition, I've got a, a few investors that are willing to partner with me on things. So if I were to purchase the property, I would give them a, a good cut of the proceeds. So now that we talked a little bit about tax sales, let's move on back over here to Tom Green County's County Clerk's Office and we see these trustee sales. So to view the current list of sales, we click here. When you click there, we end up with this. We notice that it's still going to be the 2nd of May. So they're going to be happening on the same day in the same building. It's kind of interesting because it's just one hallway in a county building. And on two sides of the hallway are both of the different auctions going on at one time. So you need to make sure that you are in place for the right auction at the right time. So we notice that there are 21 properties that are potentially for sale. And on the day of, what's going to end up happening is some of these people are going to pay up their or what they owe on their mortgage so that they can get up to current. And then they'll be taken off of this list and will be ineligible for auction. On the flip side, if they're unable to, it'll go to auction and what the starting bid is, is what is owed on the property. And that starting bid is placed by the bank or the lending institution that has lent the money to 
the current owners. And from there you bid up and you gain title to the property after the fact. So let's take a look at a couple of these. So I went through this list earlier today. I wanted to show you a couple of good deals and a couple of bad deals. So let's look at number seven here. So number seven, very small. Let's go ahead and zoom in on this some. There we go. So right off the bat, we noticed that the deed of trust happened on November 17th of 2014. Now I make a, a big assumption that almost every single loan that I'm going to be coming up against is a 30 year loan. And since we're just in April of 2017, there hasn't been a long time for Matthew Posey to have gained a whole lot of equity through natural pay down of his loan. We see that his original principal was $178,000. And let's see, he is on Chisholm Trail. So let's take a look at that real quick. Posey Matthew. Right, there we go, 4318 Chisholm Trail. He lives in Midland right now in what looks like an apartment. So that's an interesting deal. The appraisal district has his assessment at $189,000, whereas the year he purchased it, the assessment was $165,000. So it looks like there may be just a little bit of equity gain. We know that it was built in 2009, and he bought it from the second owner. All right. So let's take a look at this, 4318 Chisholm Trail. 4318 Chisholm Trail, San Angelo. So we can take a look at it on Trulia. Sure, why not? So this is the front, it looks like a, a fairly Decent house shows us where it is in relation to the other houses in the area. And it says its approximate value is 161968 which is far less than we see what his original principal was. Let's see if this one will tell us what he currently owes. Not every deed of trust or Notice of acceleration will tell you what's currently owed. But we know that the original principle was 178. One way that we can approximate what they might owe is we can go ahead and look up a amortization calculator. And in our amortization calculator, we can look up the original principal balance was 178, 125, 178, 125. We'll assume a 30 year term. Now, back in 2014, I was getting close to 4% on owner occupied residences. So let's go ahead and take a look. So we are about two years past when he purchased. So that'll put us here on the annual schedule. So at the start of year three, he'd have owed $171,723 if he was paying the minimum payment. And we know that he's not even paying that because he's being foreclosed on at this point in time. So we noticed that Trulia is saying that it's worth only 161, 162,000. Now I'm not going to believe Trulia, but because of what I know about that area, I know that it's close enough compared to what he owes on the property that I know that there's not enough equity in the property for me to, for it to be worth it to me. So the starting bid is going to be something like 171,000 dollars. 
well, first off, I'm not willing to pay $171,000 on something that may only be worth $162,000. That's just crazy. I would start out with negative equity, and that's not a good thing, especially if you're an investor. So not every foreclosure property is going to be a good deal. And there are certain indicators that you can see that might show you whether something is a good deal or not. Now, don't get me wrong. Just because somebody purchased in 2014 doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. It could be that they put a lot down on the property and they just fell behind on their mortgage payment. And in that case, there may be a deal or an ability to help them to come up with a win-win situation. So let's go back and let's take an example of a good deal. Let's look at number 15. So number 15, let's go ahead and zoom in again. We see that it is a house on 1931 College Hills Boulevard. And the original note was $90,000. And it looks like it purchased in 2011. We notice now that the principal balance has only been paid down to $87,687. So on a 30-year mortgage, you are not paying off much principal at all in the first few years. So let's take a look on the appraisal district and see what more we can find out about this. So the name, once again, was Jennifer Martinez. Martinez, Jennifer, and Rios Robert. Yep. That's the one. Hmm. So this is interesting. The appraised value is $203,000. That's a lot higher than the $90,000 initial mortgage. So this is an indicator that there might be something else going on. Let's really quickly check the tax summary. And we see that there's still some taxes owed on it. Let's go back, 1931 College Hills, homestead exempt. Let's see. So we can see because of homestead cap loss that even though the valuation is here at $203,000, they're only being taxed as if the valuation is 110 because there's a limit on how much the valuation can go up year over year. We see that the house was built in 1961. It's about 2,400 square feet. And their annual taxes are about $2,200. And they bought it in 2011, which we see based on this foreclosure statement. So this is kind of an interesting deal. We see that they originally purchased it for $90,000. And our county appraisal district seems to think that the property value is more than doubled. So let's take a look at this place, 1931 College Hills. 1931 College Hills, San Angelo. All right. So we see Realtor.com estimates its value at 177000 it looks like it's got an enclosed, what used to be a garage and has a carport. There are only 12 pictures, I guess, from its previous listing. That's great for us. Let's open this up and see if we can get it a little bit bigger. There we go. Okay, decent little kitchen setup, little bedroom, decent dining room. Good living area with a fireplace. Look at that backyard. I don't see any indicators that there is any or there are any window units. You notice that there's some issues with the siding. It's on a quarter acre lot. 
a fairly decent lot size. Hmm. So we see that it's a fairly decent house. And based on their current loan balance, we see that their the opening bid on this property is going to be somewhere in the $88,000 price range. And if the property is worth 170, then as long as I can get the property at a decent rate, I can either purchase and refinance the property or I can flip it. I can go ahead and buy it for what I can buy it for and then sell it as soon as possible. But the interesting thing here is that if there is so much equity in the property, that means that the property owners would be able to refinance the property. So it sounds like there's more of a story here than meets the eye. So I'm definitely marking this down as something for me to pay more attention to and for me to do more research on. So let's take a look at one more deal that's not necessarily good or bad. It just doesn't fit my target demographic. So this is going to be instrument 19. So we got Ronnie Dyer and Sabrina Dyer. And their original principal amount was $94,000 back in January of 2014. So it's been three years now. So this is interesting. It says surface estate only. Hmm. Surface estate only. This tells me that there is more to this story. And we have a document number. Let me write this down since I can't copy and paste it off of this PDF. 2014, because it was recorded in the year 2014, 01340. So we'll look that up in a little bit. But let's see what the property is. South half of Tract 63 and south half of Tract 62 in the Red Creek subdivision. So it looks like it's somewhere out in the countryside. So home by owner name, Dyer. Let's see, Dyer, Ronnie Dyer, five acres, south half of track 62 and 63. This is the one. So let's take a look. So we've got acres five in the subdivision. Oh, label. Here we go. There is a mobile home on it. it. Tells us what year and model it is. We see that the land value is approximately 50,000 and improvements of 88,000 for an appraised value of 138,000. It's got a double wide, 1680 square feet that we know is a 2013 because it tells us so right here. So it's only a, a four year old mobile home. Okay, we know that they bought it in 2014. Well, that's, wait a minute, that's interesting. It looks like the Dyer family purchased the property in 2009, and then there was some kind of deed transfer in 2014. And that instrument number is 2014-01338. So you'll notice that in real estate investing, a lot of times it's about detective work ahead of time so that you can see what kind of problems there are to be solved. So now that we have those two deed numbers, where do we go to look those up? Well, we go to our handy dandy Tom Green County County Clerk's Office. And now that we have the document numbers, the first one was 2014 01340. Let's hit enter and see what we got here. So this is what's being currently foreclosed on. Take a look at the PDF that it spits out. Download the PDF so we can see it better. So this was the original deed of trust. And we see that the original amount of the loan was 94,791 and it was originated 
on the 29th of January of 2014 that needs to be paid back no later than the 1st of February of 2034, which means it was a 20-year mortgage, which if it's on a mobile home, that makes sense because normally mobile homes can't be financed for 30 years. So what exactly is being mortgaged here? It looks like it's just the manufactured home. So that's an interesting thing. It's not the land that's being financed. It's only the mobile home. So it looks like they purchased the home or the, the five acres and they put the mobile home on after the fact. So now that we have that other deed instrument, let's take a look at that real quick. So we'll go back here and we'll put in the other document number. And this is the deed transfer event that we saw earlier when it went out of the wife's name. So let's download the PDF so that we can see it more clearly. Not what I meant to do. Let's go with that download PDF. So what have we got? So this is looking like there is just a transfer of title from Sabrina to Ronnie in this case. It's a gift deed. Looks like Sabrina gifted the property. That's interesting. So then let's go back to the information here on the appraisal district website and let's look up this instrument here seven or sixty seven sixty two eighteen and see if we can figure out how the property was purchased in the first place and that'll give us some more information on what we're looking at so Cherie Crenshaw had sold it hit this download PDF Consideration of the sum of one dollar and other good and valuable consideration paid to sell and convey. Is there anything else that tells us what happened here? So what we know is that it was just a normal sale. There's no indication that there is a loan or any other strings attached to this so that'd be interesting now like I said this isn't something that I'm personally interested in because it looks like the mortgage is only on the mobile home and I'm not looking to spend 90,000 what do we got $94,000 on a mobile home when I can buy one brand new for significantly less than that. So that's an example of a property that isn't in my neck of the woods, but it could be a good deal. It just takes a lot more research into it than I'm willing to do because I know that five acres is not in a part of the countryside that I would like to have the five acres in. So I'm less likely and less inclined to do that extra research because my time is valuable and so is yours. So going back to the Tom Green County County Clerk's website, let's recap real quick. We know that there are two ways other than going on realtor.com or consulting a realtor to see what's on the multiple listing service to find properties. And we know that in both of these cases, both with the tax properties and trustee sales, that there is an element of motivation, right? Because in the case of tax properties, we saw there were instances where people just had fallen behind on their taxes and other instances where heirs had inherited a property but did not know to pay property taxes. So there's a 
a different set of circumstances associated with that. And then with the foreclosure sales, we know that they've fallen behind on their mortgage on whatever kind of property it is, whether it's a house or whether it's just a mobile home, as we saw in that last example. So these are two ways that you can look to in your area to find other properties. Now, once again, there are different states that are tax lien states and different states that are tax deed states and tax or different states that are somewhere in between. So you want to go ahead and have an idea of what kind of state you're in so that you make good choices as far as acquiring properties in these uh, less than traditional ways. Or ideally you can find a way to get in touch with the owners directly to avoid the process altogether. So with the foreclosure sales, it may be a situation where you can simply knock on someone's door and they may be willing to move out in exchange for helping their credit not to deal with a foreclosure because that'll hurt their credit for seven years and that's just not good for them either. So there are several ways to gauge motivation in these kinds of situations and motivated sellers are usually the best way to get steep discounts. Now once again this is a matter of finding a way to come up with a win-win solution that fits your investment objectives and fits the seller's needs, wants, and desires. That way both sides of the transaction are happy after the fact because some there is some uh, way that both sides win and that's a good thing for everybody. So this has been a kind of a longer video compared to what I've done recently and this is a little bit different than what I have been doing. If you'd like the content and you'd like to see more of a step-by-step -step how I'm going through different processes, uh, make sure to let me know down in the comments section below. And if you like this content, please be sure to give a, this video a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more, then subscribe because then you'll get to see my videos as they pop up on a regular basis. Thanks so much for your time. I hope you have a fantastic day.